Imagine you're a front-running F1 driver. You're racing for Ferrari. You're the only driver other than Max Verstappen to have won a Grand Prix in the past 18 months, and you're in the form of your life. Yet somehow, you don't have a seat for 2025, and there's every chance you'll have to drop down the grid next year to get one. That's all because Ferrari has made the completely understandable decision to sign Lewis Hamilton, a shock move that is the primary reason for Carlos Sainz being in this absurd situation. But it's not the only bizarre factor. It's almost inconceivable that the 29-year-old wouldn't have a place on the grid next year, although it is possible. But the big question is whether the place he's likely to get is in keeping with the status and performance level of a driver who you would expect to be a dead cert for a top drive. Sainz can't stay at Ferrari, which he surely would have done had Hamilton not been available, and the doors appear to be closing on him at other top teams. Sainz puts a positive spin on everything, and understandably so, but he also admits it's unnerving not to know what the future holds. I asked him about this in China, and he revealed that he vacillates between discomfort and excitement at the possibilities of the fast-moving driver market. Sainz spoke of there being news every day when it comes to the silly season, sometimes that news closes off potential avenues. Aston Martin was the latest possibility to fall off the table given the recent announcement that Fernando Alonso is staying on for at least another two seasons. While Aston Martin hasn't officially confirmed Lance Stroll in the seat, his status appears to remain inviolable regardless of performance level. As Aston Martin team principal Mike Crack said recently, Aston Martin is Stroll's home and the project was built around him. So there's little hope of Sainz lining up at Aston Martin. Sainz's former team McLaren is also full, so that's three of the top five teams off the table. Sainz himself talks up the many opportunities on the table, arguing that all his best options are still open. But as we've already established, there's a difference between the best options and his best options, and the best options are not as open as Sainz would like. Sainz is in contention for a Red Bull seat that would reunite him with old Toro Rosso teammate Max Verstappen. That's something Red Bull's Helmut Marko has confirmed, albeit with the caveat that Red Bull can't match the lucrative offer Sainz already has from Audi to join what's currently called Sauber. Now that sounds somewhat strange, because if Red Bull wants Sainz, it can undoubtedly splash whatever cash is needed to land his services, so that suggests there's not much desire to do so. The fact is that while Sainz is in contention at Red Bull, incumbent driver Sergio Perez is the comfortable favourite. Red Bull is in no rush and wants to ensure Perez sustains his strong early season form before committing. And even if Perez were to suffer a slump in form as he did in the middle of 2023 and Red Bull wanted to drop him, there's no guarantee Sainz would be the alternative. After all, while Sainz and Verstappen got on fine personally, the relationship when they were Toro Rosso teammates back in 2015 and early 2016 was troublesome. The other possibility is that Verstappen somehow walks away from Red Bull, something that's constantly talked about but seems like an extreme long shot at best. So while Red Bull, which is for 2025 at least clearly the best option for any driver, and the only one where Sainz would consider a one-year deal given it would instantly offer him championship level machinery, is still possible, it doesn't seem likely. The main reason he's being discussed right now appears to be to keep the pressure on Perez. And for there to be any chance of Perez's seat becoming available, Sainz is going to have to wait for some time, and risk missing out on alternatives. Mercedes is the other obvious top team with an available seat thanks to Hamilton's departure, but while a seat swap seems the logical outcome and Sainz has had talks with the Silver Arrows, Mercedes has other plans. The obstacle Sainz faces is 17-year-old Kimi Antonelli, who had his first test in F1 machinery in a 2021 Mercedes W12 at the Red Bull Ring before the Chinese Grand Prix weekend. He's highly rated, a driver Mercedes is keen to put into a race seat probably next year, or at least not long after. Therefore, even if Mercedes needed a stopgap were it to decide Antonelli isn't ready, the best it would offer is a relatively short-term deal. And even then, neither Mercedes nor Sainz would want it to be just a one-year contract. Sainz is keen on a long-term deal, and it wouldn't really be worth his while holding on for a one-year Mercedes offer given its current troubles even if it were likely, especially if he would still have to wait and see how Antonelli progresses before Mercedes commits to him. Sainz hasn't publicly ruled out going short-term and there is an argument for taking immediate competitiveness over longer-term assurances, but as he says, it all depends on the compromises of the offers. That means hopes aren't high for Sainz to land a Silver Arrows drive right now. Therefore, he must consider options in the back half of the grid, which is why he's being honest when he claims that he and his management have been talking to every single team. And there's one standout option down the field. 
Sauber, which becomes Audi in 2026, has been aggressively courting Sainz with what could potentially give him both the big paycheck his CV demands and the long-term deal he wants. The trouble is, does he really want to go there? Yes, it's turning into a manufacturer team, a process that has recently accelerated thanks to Audi taking over the whole of Sauber, having originally planned to own 75% of it. Audi has also got a big reputation and a track record for success in all sorts of forms of motorsport, though not F1. So the chance to spearhead a major factory team has its appeals. It's also willing to splash the cash. As Sauber Group Managing Director Alessandro Aluni Bravi puts it, his team is a player in the driver market. And as it has already signed Nico Hülkenberg as one of its drivers, it can wait for as long as it takes for Sainz to make a decision. The trouble is, the team is a very long way from being a top F1 operation, and the engine is a big unknown. So if Sainz does end up there, it's a move that guarantees long-term stability and great financial reward, but only the hope rather than the expectation of success in the long term. While Audi is the obvious choice in the back half of the grid, there are other possibilities. Williams is one, and there have been talks with the Sainz camp. Williams is understood to see the Spaniard as the top choice, albeit a long shot. Williams is in talks with many drivers as it chases a replacement for the underperforming Logan Sargent, but it's difficult to see Sainz seeing this as the best option, despite the team making a good case to his management in terms of the long-term vision for the team. Beyond that, while Haas and RB would be a logical moves, a return to Alpine, which Sainz raced for from late 2017 to the end of 2018 in its Renault guise, can't be completely discounted given its status as a works team. But its dismal start to 2024 has led the Sainz camp to downgrade that possibility even further. There are several other factors that make this decision so vital for Sainz. While he will always be known as a Ferrari driver, you can argue that where he ends up in 2025 could represent a career-defining move. He turns 30 in September, so while his next F1 team won't necessarily be his last, he will likely be regarded as a veteran option if there's another move to come after that. His desire for a long-term deal is compromised by the fact that he will be choosing a team for 2026 based on limited information given the likely impact of the major rule changes, particularly to the power units. The last time F1 made a big change to the power unit regulations was in 2014. Mercedes hit the front as it was widely expected to, but that was more clearly telegraphed given it had chosen to start work on its engine concept earlier than the rest, based on the discussions between manufacturers about the regulations, while rivals delayed. This time round, all of the engine manufacturers have taken a more strategic approach to power units that aren't as radical a departure as they were from 2013 to 2014, which is necessary given the power unit cost cap and the freeze on current engine developments. And definitive power unit development progress is a crucial piece of information that Science will not have before he makes his choice. When talking about his future, he makes it clear his focus is more on 2026 and beyond than 2025 in the short term, so any decision will require a healthy amount of crystal ball gazing. That's why it's essential that he doesn't allow this situation to distract or frustrate him, and his on-track performances prove that he's compartmentalising effectively. So just how well is Science performing this year, and is he really the best he's been in Formula 1? It is usually a given that drivers will generally get better as experience builds. What's more, the Ferrari Science is driving now is a more consistent car with a much broader window of performance than before. Ask Science if he's at his best and he gives an equivocal answer, arguing that it's unclear because of the difficulty of disentangling driver performance and the opportunity presented by the car. As the man himself says, am I at my best? I don't know. Science argues that it looks like he's at his best primarily because the car is so good, leading to consistently good results. He points out that there were also strong stretches of form in his McLaren and Toro Rosso days. Note that he left Renault out of that list, most likely because his sole full season with that team in 2018 was, relative to his experience level, his worst in F1. But even that was still a decent campaign. The bottom line is that Science has always been a very good Grand Prix driver and has regularly produced performances at a high level. But what is clear is that this is probably his strongest start to a season in his time at Ferrari. Despite missing the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix due to appendicitis, he has had a good run compared to Charles Leclerc. In qualifying, he has an average advantage of 0.120 seconds, having outqualified Leclerc three times out of five, and to be able to push a driver as quick as Leclerc that hard and so often come out on top tells you how good Sainz is. His race results have also been consistently good, as even though Leclerc finished ahead in both races during the Shanghai Grand Prix weekend, the pace difference was negligible. And Sainz knows he needs to make a good impression, as his willingness to fight teammate Leclerc as hard as he did in the China sprint race when he forced him off at the hairpin proves. 
This shows what Sainz is capable of and why he's a driver who is on so many shortlists, albeit seemingly not at the top for any of the front-running teams who would give him the machinery to deliver on his number one priority of winning. Whether he will is another question, as we've seen the driver market isn't looking favourable for him and right now the most likely destination is the Audi project that, realistically, is far from his real first choice. As Sainz says, F1 is a very particular sport, blending the sporting side and the politics, and that's why despite his strong performances there's so much uncertainty about his long-term future. Some would argue that's unfair, but at the same time it's also partly down to where Sainz stands in F1's driver pecking order. He's a very high-calibre performer, one capable of winning races in the right car. But Leclerc has on balance had the edge over Sainz in their time together at Ferrari. A glance at key statistics shows that he qualifies and outraces Sainz over 60% of the time. Sainz is seen as an outstanding second driver, more than that really, a number 1.5 if you like, by top teams rather than a cast-iron title-winning team leader, but that still puts him in elite company. The circumstances are certainly absurd for Sainz, who has proved himself time and again in frontline machinery and would be a valuable asset for any F1 team. Sainz's situation is a reminder that, in F1, it's only the few megastars like Hamilton and Verstappen who have full control of their destiny. But if Sainz keeps doing what he's doing, then he could yet force his way back to the top of the list of a team that could conceivably give him the race-winning machinery he craves and deserves in 2025.